they said, uh, who's going to stay behind to shovel dirt on top of my door? And I said to myself, well, I guess when a sixth grader can understand the deficiencies in the emergency evacuation plan for nuclear war, that uh, it probably is pretty obvious to just about everyone else, except the federal government. My feeling is that the same is true here. I have my 1990 emergency plan information calendar uh, to be uh, mailed out to, uh, by the New Hampshire Office of Emergency Management so that the uh, residents of New Hampshire will know what uh, they should do in the event of an accident. Make sure you don't go to your school to pick up your child uh, in the event of a nuclear accident. Uh, turn off the turn off the water and close the doors and the windows. And uh, the first thing you should do if you're in a nuclear accident is take this calendar with you, it says, because uh, this, this could be the key to your survival. And I suppose that's just about all they're going to be left with as they're running down the street, because there won't have been any really effective nuclear preparedness which has been put in place. That's quite clear at this point. Um, have decisions of the Atomic Safety and Licensing Appeal Board ever been overruled by the Atomic Safety and Licensing Board? That borders enough on the issues that, that are under contention that I am not going to answer that, sir. That is a factual question. I don't think it goes to any uh, relevant substantive question that is now being heard by the court. Chairman Carr? No, I, I say it borders on emergency planning issues, and I'm not going to answer it. Chairman Carr, are you refusing to answer the question? Repeat the question. Are you refusing to answer the question? I, I have to remember what the question was. <laughs> if Congressman Markey will repeat the question, which we are refusing to answer. OK, thank you. But we're not sure. Okay. Congressman Markey, would you repeat the question thank to Chairman, Chairman Carr? I will be glad to. Have decisions of the atomic Safety and Licensing Appeal Board ever been before been overruled by the Atomic Safety and Licensing Board? I am a short timer with only three years experience in the agency. Let me check with the general counsel. Thank you. No. They have not at any point. Um, if there is no uh, minimum evacuation time for a nuclear power plant. Could the NRC license a plant for which the minimum estimated evacuation time is eight hours, that 12 one, hours? I will not answer. That has to do with emergency planning, and I am not going to answer that question. This is a generic question. I am not going to answer that question. Why is that? It has to do with emergency planning. It, it, I am not asking you a question about the Seabrook nuclear power plant. Does the question have to do with emergency planning? It does have to do with emergency then planning. Then I'm not going to answer it. It doesn't have to do with any relevant issue that is now being considered by I the... I refer you to my statement and my letter to the chairman. Chairman Carr, are you refusing to answer the That's question? That's correct. On emergency planning, I will refuse to answer all questions. On what legal basis, Mr. The, Chairman, do you refuse to answer the subcommittee's the question? question? The le emergency planning is still under contention. If you need the legal basis, it's the bill's If you would suspend, Mr. Chairman, for just one second, uh, I'm, not, I'm not a lawyer, and we have a lawyer up here. And it is the Pillsbury doctrine if they uh, want I, the legal I, basis. I understand that. If you would not mind, Mr. Chairman, suspending one moment, I'll respond to you. Thank you very much. Chairman Carr, the uh, counsel to the United States House of Representatives has informed me that uh, in his judgment and in my judgment as chairman of the subcommittee, in fact, uh, the subcommittee does not necessarily concur with uh, your judgment or with your counsel's judgment, uh, but will defer uh, on the issue of whether or not you can be or should be required to order the question, uh, answer the question. In the meantime, 
uh, I would ask the two members of the Commission who have recused themselves from this matter and have not participated in the Seabrook matter uh, if they will respond to the question since they have no direct and will have no direct involvement in the matter currently before the Commission. But that, they, sir, they well, might. That, Mr. Chairman, that question is directed to uh, Commissioner Curtis and Commissioner Remick. Commissioner Curtis. Mr. Chairman, in view of the fact that uh, I have abstained from participating in Commission decisions on contested issues that have arisen or might arise in the Seabrook proceeding currently pending before the NRC involving the adequacy of the emergency preparedness plan for the Seabrook facility, I do not think it would be appropriate to comment on the decisions that have been rendered by the Commission on matters where I have abstained. Commissioner Remick. I fully agree with the statement just made by Commissioner Curtis. I have disqualified myself on uh, any matters relating to the emergency planning for Seabrook, and I think it would be inappropriate for me to answer that question. Commissioner, this does not relate to the Seabrook emergency evacuation plan. It's a generic question, as Mr. Markey indicated. It's a general question. I would once ask you again to respond to the question since it does not deal with Seabrook. I think it's inappropriate for me to, to answer that question. Even though it doesn't deal with Seabrook at all? I think it does indirectly deal with Seabrook. Parliamentary inquiry, uh, Mr. Chairman. Uh, uh, the gentleman from Oregon, Mr. Smith, is recognized for a parliamentary inquiry. It, uh, it appears that uh, the gentlemen uh, uh, have uh, good cause uh, since the, uh, the matter is still before the courts not to uh, uh, speak here. I don't think they're refusing uh, the committee on any other grounds other than the fact that I believe the chairman uh, Carr said that it was uh, evacuation the, times are a contested issue. It's uh, it's in the courts. I I would think that they would be within their rights not to not to speak uh, should they uh, do anything that would uh, upset the court uh, at this point. Careful, don't get too much detail here. We're talking politics here. I don't care. Chairman Carr, will you provide the subcommittee within 72 hours uh, a, a written uh, explanation of your legal justification for refusing to answer these questions? Happily. And the committee uh, will reconvene at that time uh, to make a judgment as to whether or not you can be or should be ordered to answer the question, the gentleman from uh, Massachusetts, Mr. Markey, is recognized. I thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman, very much. In the uh, 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 decision which you did make, uh, I understand that it will be very difficult to have you, Mr. Chairman, answer any generic questions uh, uh, or specific questions uh, related to Seabrook and um, and. Uh, I'm going to just uh, accept the inevitable here and not uh, proceed uh, uh, down that path of having you invoke that right, regardless of whether or not I believe or the chairman of the committee believes that it's appropriate. It's clear to me that you don't want to answer and you don't want to read and you don't want to hear, you don't want to visit, and I understand all that. That's, that's all part of the pattern going back to 1972 with this plant when Melder and Thompson and all of his glory decided that he'd plant. I think you're violating the Pillsbury Doctrine now by browbeating me, sir. Uh, the um, the um, gentleman is uh, uh, unfortunately feeling uh, a little bit of, uh, let's say, uh, Anger might not be the correct word, but a little bit, I'm a little bit perturbed that you won't answer generic questions. There's no question about it. I'm not upset that you won't answer specific questions about Seabrook. I think that's perfectly within your right, and in the no manner, shape, or form would I want uh, you to respond to questions that in any way could taint this case. Uh, I was uh, intending for you to answer generic questions, and if uh, you feel as though uh, my uh, uh, be, my being upset with you because you won't even answer generic issues uh, is a browbeating of you, then you have every right to feel that way, but it's not uh, related in any manner, shape, or form to the specific issues that are in contestation at the Federal Court of Appeals. Um, I'll just, con I'll, I'll conclude on this, Mr. Chairman, because I know that there's a, um, little likelihood that we will get to those issues. Um, here's my problem that I have. 
The standard which the NRC uses um, to, in fact, license a nuclear power plant um, should be consistent with the law that passed out of this committee requiring reasonable assurance uh, that uh, uh, there would be adequate emergency evacuation plans constructed around nuclear power plants in this country. Now the NRC adopted a regulation with a checklist of 16 requirements, none of which require any estimate of the dose people might receive. Um, now I have a problem with that as a standard. There's no question about it. I think it's the relevant question. The checklist in and of itself means nothing if it doesn't relate to the uh, actual a problem which is seeking to be addressed, which is the reduction of the exposure to uh, the uh, dose rem of the, for the uh, affected individual, man, woman, a child. The NRC's approach to emergency planning is like a doctor deciding whether a person is alive or dead by taking out a checklist. Does he have arms, legs, ears, two eyes, a mouth? But a heartbeat is not on the checklist. Following the NRC's logic, a dead man could be alive because we never reached the central question of whether or not, in fact, there is real protection for the people against radiation inside that, uh, inside that uh, evacuation area. And finally, I, I'd say this, Mr. Chairman. In 1986, a mayonnaise truck overturned on the Long Island Expressway, tying up traffic for one half an hour longer than the NRC's estimate of how long it would take to evacuate the entire community surrounding Shoreham. The NRC, the NRC simply does not want to contemplate the potentially catastrophic, catastrophic effect of a flat tire when it comes to sites like Shoreham or Seabrook. And I guess at heart that's where we differ. And to the extent to which the impo reports are still available, uh, the, the, um, the, uh, the state's attorney general of Massachusetts, the communities that live in the near vicinity uh, would still uh, like to ensure, be guaranteed that the chairman of the commission and the other commissioners have availed themselves of all information. Uh, I make that request to you, uh, that you make, your, you make it yourself available, that you take the time, that you do the reading, uh, and you give the assurances in all good faith that you've done that reading uh, that guarantees that you've, uh, that you've protected the public to the optimum extent possible. I thank the Chair. The uh, gentleman from Oregon, Mr. Smith, whose patience the Chair appreciates is recognized for whatever time he may consume. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I have a few uh, questions I'd like to ask, and these will be questions uh, of the panel. I, I really uh, don't have any speeches. I, I'd like to see this thing go forward. Uh, approximately how many pages of documentation does the NRC have on uh, Seabrook, if you could answer that, uh, Mr. Chairman? Do you have any idea? Uh, or is no, it I the, don't have any idea. Sir. Is it in the tons? or I mean, w w you have studied this. How many hours have you spent uh, trying to study this problem? Uh, well, I, mean, I would say that... I mean, this isn't something that's just been done since last Saturday. We've been going on here for 17 years. Mm -hmm. Well, I, uh, the general counsel passed me a piece of paper that says for the construction permit there were 60 days of hearings, over 12,000 pages of transcripts. For the operating license there were over 110 days of hearings and 28,000 pages of transcript. 60 days and 110 days? Uh, yeah, gosh, uh, you know, I mean, that's, that's a tremendous amount of study and they, they were well attended, right? They weren't... Uh, they weren't just uh, done in the back room. Well, those hearings were done by our board, sir. Yes, yeah, sir. Well, you know, I, I think it's very frustrating for those of us that believe in safe nuclear energy who would like to see this opportunity to try and uh, reduce some of the pollution problems that we have and to try and save some of the fossil fuel. And I just uh, would uh, say that uh, you're a very patient group of uh, fellows there. I don't know how you... Uh, get by uh, the patients to uh, put up with some of the problems that we hand to you. Uh, you you've been given uh, a law to try and uh, guide your way through these hoops and uh, the people uh, at Seabrook uh, or uh, Sharm or any other of the uh, 
facilities have had to go through all the hoops uh, to arrive where they have a, a license. This one, I guess, uh, uh, if, unless there's been a stay issued, would probably be uh, ready to uh, operate soon. Is that uh, hopefully? I just, uh, you know, you get frustrated in this uh, job uh, trying to, to be sure that uh, you get a, a fair hearing too. And um, so uh, I think that uh, 170 days of uh, hearings is a, a good number and 17 years in the process. How long has the facility been built? Uh, you know that? Uh, they, uh, they were ready to operate in 86 is what they've been told. In 1986? Yeah. The, well. uh, since the 1st of March, we have had one, two, three, five, seven letters from the Congress to answer with numerous questions and multiple questions, and so we've been putting in some time trying to get answers for all those. Well, I think uh, I probably uh, don't have any uh, further questions uh, of you. I, uh, I see, uh, I'll pass it back to the chairman, but I think that uh, you've been very patient today, indeed. The gentlelady from the state of Nevada. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I have no further questions. Chairman Carr, on February 27th, Senator Kennedy sent you questions concerning weld radiographs at Seabrook. You kindly provided us a copy of your response to the senator's inquiry. Included in the response was a February 28th memorandum from Mr. Russell to Mr. Taylor. This memorandum addressed the question of the rate at which a radiograph reviewer might find defects. The memorandum stated, and I quote, our assessment is that a 20% reject rate of radiographs during the first review by a level three examiner is not unusual. Can you tell me which are the nuclear reactor projects in the country where the first review by a level three examiner resulted in a 20% rejection rate? Uh, we'll, we'll try to provide that for the record. Uh, at the, uh, it certainly wasn't, uh, at that period of time in Seabrook, it wasn't unusual since it had ranged anywhere up to 38% or something rejection. They were having trouble getting good welders. And, uh, you said so the rejection rate sometimes went as high as 38%. I think that's the best of my re recollection. Was this applicable to uh, Seabrook exclusively, or are you speaking generally about well, their... Well, generally there were welding problems in the country, building plants at those times. I think we had some other problems around the country plants, but we'll try to get the answer for you for your question. Are you able to say whether or not the rate of rejection across the country equaled... Uh, the rate of rejection at Seabrook, Seabrook, which at its high was 38 percent, you've said? Uh, I think that uh, in some plants across the country it was comparable to Seabrook. Would you say that Seabrook was higher than other plants across the country? I don't know that. I'll have to find that out. Uh, Mr. Joseph Wampler was employed at the Seabrook site as a senior radiograph reviewer from August 83 to January 84. In early January 84 he was fired. Mr. Wampo subsequently claimed that he had been rejecting radiographs at the rate of 20%. Uh, my questions, do you know the percentage of the radiographs reviewed by Mr. Wampler that were, were rejected by him? Uh, no, I don't know that. I don't know how many he rejected. Uh, do you know how many non-conformance reports and CRs were prepared by Mr. Wampler during his tenure as a Pullman Higgins employee from August 83 through January 84? Yeah, our latest check shows that he submitted three nonconformance reports. Three. Uh, what NRC inspection report addresses the problems found by Mr. Wampler, which you've just uh, described in the well, three? There are a number of those. Uh, we have uh, finished replying to Senator Kennedy's questions, and, and I didn't have a chance to get that through the rest of the commission and signed back over here. But those questions were adequately answered, and we'll get that over to you. Does Senator Kennedy have those answers? Not yet. I haven't signed them out yet. I understand. It's my understanding, Mr. Chairman, that when Mr. Wampler was <laughs> fired, he went to the NRC inspector and said there are 16 uh, NCRs. Uh, do, do you know what has happened to those 16? Uh, he said there were about 16. Uh, I don't know that we have a list of those. If that was the list that Senator Kennedy put in the back of his letter, it turned out to be 15, and the documentation for those 15... I think that's a different, I think it's a different list. Mr. Wampler provided the NRC with what he said were his 16 at the time of his dismissal, which was in January of 1984. And I'm asking for the disposition of those 16. Uh, 
And the indication was he provided us a list of those 16 at that time? He said there were, he said there were 16 non-conforming reports. It's uh, those 16 that I'm concerned we'll about. I'll get you that answer. I uh, appreciate it. Uh, you have you have provided us documents that indicate at the time Mr. Wampler was fired, he was in the process of completing these nonconformance reports. After he was fired, Mr. Wampler was informed, uh, did inform the NRC of these unfinished reports, which is what I've just said. On January 12th of 84, the NRC staff informed Mr. Wampler that his 16 NCRs, nonconforming reports, would be reviewed during a routine inspection. I gather you don't know uh, whether that has yet been completed or not. Uh, I I don't think that we informed him that we would check those 16 per se, but uh, it was uh, the information that we gave him was to the effect that we would follow up recognizing that he had 16 outstanding ones to make sure there was a process in place to take care of them. But we'll also provide that one for the record. This is covered in the, in the letter that we need to get signed out back to Senator Kennedy. And we'll, Do you have a copy? We'll provide of, you a copy of that. Appreciate that. Do you have a copy of the letter you sent to Mr. Wampler in which you explained what you just explained to me? I don't believe there was a letter. I think it was a, uh, uh, but we'll provide you the documentation of what we have there. I think it's probably documentation of the inspector who talked to Mr. Wampler. Well, I have a copy of the letter which was written on January 12th of 1984 to Mr. Wampler by Robert Gallo, NRC Region 1, mm -hmm. in which he said, and I quote one paragraph, your additional concern regarding the completion of approximately 16 nonconformance reports that were in preparation at the time of your termination will be reviewed by this office during a routine NRC Region 1 inspection at the Seabrook site. Right. We appreciate, the, we appreciate your bringing these matters to our attention. And the concern was that there would be some follow-up. And uh, that concern was taken care of, and we'll provide that. Can you tell me, if you know, sir, what follow-up was taken? Uh, yes. Uh, uh, I read that, but I hate to re depend on my memory uh, to give you an answer right now. I understand. Mr. Russell did write a memo on February 28th indicating that the deficiencies which we've discussed have been corrected. And I'm wondering uh, what is the basis of that? We'll provide you that documentation. Mr. Russell's February 28, 1990 memorandum leaves the impression that NRC staff have confidence that Mr. Wampler's findings regarding radiographs and or welds, W-E-L-D-S, had been recognized and the deficiencies implicit therein corrected. This confidence, we infer, was derived from a series of inspections, yet the various inspection reports provided us to date, I have a list of them here, I won't read them, as far as we can tell, don't recognize that problems of the magnitude described by Wampler occurred nor do these reports contain sufficient documentation to enable an independent reviewer to determine the qualitative and quantitative nature of deficiencies in activities carried out by the contractor responsible for a significant portion of the safety-related welding at Seabrook. And I would ask, what then is the basis for NRC management in making the finding that the safety-related welding activities at Seabrook were conducted in accordance with the Commission's regulations, if we'll, that indeed is your view. We'll provide you that. Uh, that's, uh, we followed up on that. You're absolutely right. You couldn't track it from the data we gave you. We'll give you the data that you can track it from. And, uh, Mr. Chairman, when would you be back to me on that? Uh, uh, if, pro approximately. If, if I hadn't been here, I would have gotten it signed out this afternoon. We, we, we did, I understand that you're busy. We did get you uh, these questions two weeks ago, so if we could get them promptly, I'd appreciate it. Uh, I, have, uh, I have no further questions. Uh, Mr. Smith, Ms. Vukanovic, no, Mr. Markey, have you any further questions? Chairman Carr, we appreciate your attendance. I would remind you that you've uh, committed to me to respond within 72 hours in writing uh, as to the legal explanation for a refusal to answer those questions which Congressman Markey has put to you. It was uh, one question from, Chair, from Mr. Markey. Right? Yes, Correct. one question from Mr. Markey. Also, as to why the other commissioners who had recused themselves from the Seabrook matter also refused to respond to Congressman Markey's question. Yes, sir. Thank you very Thank much, you Mr. Very Chairman. Much. Thank you, commissioners, very much. I want to yield the chair to the gentleman from Massachusetts. I'll call the next panel, which is the last panel, Mr. Robert Pollard, Senior Nuclear Safety. Oh, it's not the last panel. It's not even close to the last panel. It's panel number five of eight. Mr. Robert Pollard, senior nuclear safety engineer, union of concerned scientists, 
Mr. Ralph Nader. Gentlemen, welcome, and uh, we would ask the, uh, the uh, people who are by the doors down there if they could please close them so that uh, we could have quiet in the hearing room. And uh, what I'd like to do is to uh, once again um, introduce uh, Mr. Robert Pollard, who is a senior nuclear safety engineer for the Union of Concerned Scientists, and Mr. Ralph Nader. A consumer advocate. Uh, let us begin with you, Mr. Nader. Welcome to the subcommittee. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'm going to uh, ask that the entire testimony be placed in the record and then summarize a portion of it. Mr. Pollard will summarize the technical uh, excerpts from the INPO reports, and I'd like a concluding remark. Without objection, uh, all of the written material that Mr. Pollard and Mr. Nader wish to have included in the record uh, will be included at the appropriate point. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. It's difficult in the light of the questions which have been asked today by members of the committee and some of the comments of the witnesses uh, to provide our testimony with the proper frame of reference. We could, of course, point out uh, that our energy future in this country is one that has to choose between excessive use of fossil fuels and nuclear on the one hand and the abundant uh, opportunity for energy efficiency and the transition of our economy to solar on the other. But this testimony has a very special focus. It deals with a nuclear power plant in New Hampshire about to go into full power operation which contains within its core massive amounts of radioactivity and radioactive gas, which should an accident occur, whether natural sabotage or negligence, could release such enormous quantities of radioactivity as to make uninhabitable hundreds, if not thousands, of square miles where people are now living and working. The Chernobyl analogy is well taken in terms of what a nuclear power plant disaster could be like. The latest information is that 20 percent of Belorussia, a Soviet province, its arable land cannot be used as just one illustration of what we're really talking about here. But this testimony focuses on the disclosure for the first time, and that itself is instructive, the disclosure for the first time of reports called evaluation reports by the Institute of Nuclear Power Operations on the Seabrook power plant. These reports are conducted by an institute that is funded by the utilities, which in turn are paid for by the consumers who pay their electric bill. Under a cozy arrangement between INPO and the NRC, the NRC in my opinion, breaches its proper discretion by delegating regulatory responsibilities to a private industry group and in return is given deniability because it does not require the transmission of these INPO evaluation reports, not to mention the more candid observation packets, which are shredded as a matter of policy, does not require the transmission of these evaluation reports of the safety, operation, and management of the Seabrook plant to the Nuclear Regulatory Commission. As our testimony notes, this kind of relationship has actually been formalized between the NRC and INPO. And most 
prominently in a October 1988 revised memorandum of agreement known as an MOA. And some of the MOA provisions relevant to the types of the INPO appraisal and evaluation reports discussed in this testimony are as follows, quote, NRC desires to recognize INPO evaluation activities to the extent that these activities are effective in helping meet NRC's responsibilities as well as lessen the burden imposed on the industry by duplicative appraisal activities, end quote. I don't see anything in the statutes passed by Congress that lets the NRC delegate its regulatory responsibilities, however less significant it might deem those portions delegated to a private, secretive industry trade association. The memorandum continues, quote, NRC requires access to selected INPO documents and information, as well as the opportunity to give credit for INPO activities and to thereby avoid unnecessary duplication, end quote. But as Chairman Carr just informed you, requiring access does not mean they have access. It means that they can go and look these over, but they can't make copies. It also means that on a matter of inestimable safety significance to the future of millions of people, hundreds of years hence, should a disaster occur at Seabrook, the unesteemed chairman of the Nuclear Regulatory Commission did not take the time to appraise himself of what we are about to disclose by an industry group whose position he cannot categorize in any way as being prejudicial because he is part of the same thought process and part of the same constituency that he imposes through his agency on the American public. Quote again from MOA, INPO expects its member utilities to make operating plan evaluation reports available to the NRC for review or reading. Further, INPO will make final evaluation reports available to the Nuclear Regulatory Commission for review or reading by appropriate NRC management personnel. How generous of them. The consumers pay for these reports, and the trade association who prepares, which prepares them then says to the government, which is funded by the taxpayer, that the government can come and look at them. We're not dealing here with some minor variation of bridge or poker strategy. We're dealing with what could be the most disastrous catastrophe ever confronting the United States of America, domestically produced, whether through negligence or other mishap that might occur. It's hard to proceed with the degree of equanimity required by the late hour. As someone who has been involved in reviewing nuclear power since 1971, whose predictions about the economic cost of nuclear power have been borne out, whose observations about the dictatorial practices of the Atomic Energy Commission and the Nuclear Regulatory Agency have been borne out, whose arrogance <coughs> attributed to these executive agencies toward Congress, toward their potential victims, and toward dedicated citizen petitioners have been bored out with increasing frequency in recent years. I find the attitude of these servants of the taxpayer displayed this afternoon and in prior months completely unacceptable. But they can display these attitudes because they have nothing to lose. If there's a disaster at Seabrook, who will be fired in the Nuclear Regulatory Commission? Who will be prosecuted? Who will be fined? Who will be fired in the federal government? Who will be fired at public service? Who will be sanctioned? Perhaps a wayward janitor. The, the experience of TMI illustrates that we are dealing with a dictatorial, no-fault regulatory agency that is vulnerable to no sanction vulnerable to no effective oversight except the proper comments of some members of this committee and some members of Congress. The NRC is disdain for the public's right to know about imposed findings is especially outrageous since the NRC has insisted on turning many of its regulatory functions over to INPO. 
public citizen has been engaged in litigation under the Freedom of Information Act with the NRC to obtain INPO reports since 1984. I must emphasize, Mr. Chairman, that the statutory authorization of the Nuclear Regulatory Commission is severely and intensely defective in the light of the experience of their dictatorial practice over there. There needs to be a very close review and amendment of the congressional statutes authorizing the NRC to go about its business so that they cannot tie up citizen groups and the courts year after year against the common sense requirements of letting the public know about what they're doing on a matter that the public has every stake in knowing about. Thundering representations from accurate members of Congress will be no substitute for a dramatic and fundamental revision of the Nuclear Regulatory Committee Commission statutes to deal with three areas. One, it's accountability to Congress. Two, it's accountability to its potential victims, the people around nuclear power plants. And three, it's accountability to its own employees and the right of its own employees to swear under their oath of office that they will bring their conscience to work every day. The public, the commission, excuse me, for example, rather than promulgate its own requirements for the training and qualifications of nuclear power plant personnel as Congress required in 1982, has simply rubber stamped in post training program. The commission did the same with regard to fitness for duty requirements. You remember the history of post TMI indicated that there was, uh, shall we say, more than modest failure of the training of personnel at Three Mile Island. In essence, the Commission has allowed INPO to take over many of the Commission's own vital regulatory functions, yet at the same time it's allowing INPO to ignore essential elements of public accountability and access, which the Commission would have had to afford if it had not ceded control to an industry group. The public is therefore getting the short end of the stick in two different ways. First, because a self-interested industry group, rather than a federal agency, is entrusted with regu regulating the safety of nuclear power plants. And second, because the industry group is permitted to conduct its quasi-governmental functions in complete secrecy. In essence, if the NRC is willing to simply hand over its statutory responsibilities to the nuclear industry, which of course it shouldn't, it should at least be prevented from surrendering the public's right to know at the same time. The area in and around Seabrook is seething with disgruntlement. There will be more reports released. For the time being, Mr. Pollard will discuss and interpret excerpts from the INPO reports on the Seabrook power plant, which have never been disclosed before. They haven't been disclosed by the NRC, they haven't been disclosed by public service, and they have not been disclosed by Congress because Congress has not been able or perhaps willing to obtain them. Mr. Pollard will comment on these uh, points and explain just how serious they are in terms of stopping this plant from going into full power operation. Thank you very much. Uh, the time uh, has expired and we'll recognize Mr. Pollard. First of all, but first I'd like to uh, uh, state, and I, I, I believe the members and the audience will be interested to know, to know that the Court of Appeals acted uh, late this afternoon to deny the stay requested uh, by the interveners. Uh, as a result, the owners of Seabrook are now free to start up the plant uh, while uh, legal remedies are being pursued. So uh, the court has now ruled and uh, the plant will be proceeding. Uh, but uh, I would also assume that it would free up the uh, commission, the uh, chairman of the Nuclear Regulatory Commission to now answer in the immediate near future some of the questions which he was unwilling to <coughs> discuss with us this afternoon. Let us turn now and recognize uh, Mr. Robert Pollard who has been a, a many time visitor to 
uh, this committee. Yes, I've, I've enjoyed seeing the Interior Committee in action again. What, what I propose to do, Mr. Chairman, our testimony contains a great deal of technical information in language that's not necessarily familiar to everyone. What I'd like to do is simply summarize the conclusion which I have reached by reviewing the INPO documents which are dated between 1983 and late 1989. <clears throat> Briefly give you the bases for that conclusion and give you two examples only. Based upon my experience as a reactor engineer and project manager for the Nuclear Regulatory Commission for about six years, it seems beyond dispute to me that the safety deficiencies described in the INPO reports, if verified, make it impossible for the NRC to have had or to have today a valid technical basis for having issued a full power operating license to the Seabrook nuclear plant. The INPO documents are addressed to evaluations of the Seabrook station in areas of the construction evaluations, evaluation of New Hampshire Yankee Division's corporate support and monitoring of the Seabrook station. They include trip reports written by INPO after observing emergency preparedness audits. Given the time available, I concentrated my review on the more recent INPO documents, specifically three dated in October of 19, excuse me, March of 1988, September of 1989, and December 26th of 1989. One of these documents dated in, in March of 88 enclosed a trip report from February of 88, which essentially was an assessment of the Seabrook Emergency Preparedness Program. This trip report discusses and makes significant recommendations, and those are imposed words, regarding the organization of the Seabrook Emergency Preparedness Program, the emergency plan itself, as well as the emergency plan implementing procedures, the emergency preparedness training program going on at Seabrook, and the emergency public information program. Info, info found deficiencies in virtually all these areas. For example, under organization of the program, INPO found that several New Hampshire Yankee personnel did not know their complete assigned responsibilities and had not ever seen their position descriptions. INPO found under the emergency plan implementing procedures that revisions were being made to emergency preparedness procedures in an unauthorized manner and that shortcuts were being used to speed up even this process and user impacts are not being considered. Impo found no documentation exists for this unauthorized process. Under the subject of training, Impo determined that the emergency training programs do not currently comply with the requirements specified procedure. Specifically, training instructors were being selected and qualified without even following Seabrook's own well-defined criteria for how you go about selecting and qualifying people who are going to train the people responsible for carrying out emergency preparedness. It's my view that given these deficiencies in the Seabrook Emergency Preparedness Program, there's no reason to question, excuse me, there is reason to question the validity of the NRC and FEMA evaluations of emergency drills conducted prior to this INPO report and prior to public service correcting the deficiencies, assuming, and I have no basis for the assumption, that they have been corrected. I'd like to turn now to one example of a technical deficiency which would illustrate why an emergency plan might be needed. This comes from a document, as I recall, yes, I'm correct, if, uh, <clears throat> in the fall of 1989. 
INPO concluded that the preventive maintenance measures have not been established at the Seabrook station to, identif to identify check valve performance problems or degradation in some important systems. The check valve problems have surfaced at Seabrook station by multiple failures of check valves. INPO found that Seabrook Station has not paid attention to INPO's significant operating experience reports warning them about the significance of check valve failures and leakage. In fact, INPO had to do separate correspondence to Seabrook emphasizing the safety significance. The NRC will be able to explain further to you an accident they like to refer to as an interfacing systems loss of coolant accident. In a nutshell, what this accident involves is a failure or significant leakage of the boundary between the high pressure reactor coolant system and other low pressure systems connected to it. In the worst case, which could be caused by failure or excessive leakage of check valves, what would happen is you would have a loss of coolant accident. That is, the water would be lost from the reactor. It would effectively destroy the capability of the emergency core cooling systems, which would lead to a meltdown. The meltdown would then effectively occur into an open containment, because the pipe connected to the reactor would be broken and there'd be a hole for the radioactive material to escape outside. The bottom line is, from the time of the initial check valve failure until there are radiation doses off-site in the range of 100 rem would be about an hour or perhaps an hour and a half in the worst case. The NRC's only possible defense I know of for allowing nuclear power plants to operate, knowing full well the significance of this accident, is they, I don't know the right word, whether believe or at least say that they think the probability is low of such an accident occurring. But if such an accident occurs, that's of course one of the reasons to have an emergency plan. Furthermore, when you do an analysis of how likely such an accident is, you have to make some assumptions about the quality of the check valves, the quality of the testing of the check valves, the preventative maintenance program, in order to get some estimate of how likely such an accident might be. The facts are at the Seabrook station, the very valves which INPO has warned Seabrook about have already leaked. INPO has not even developed a preventative maintenance program for check valves. But on top of this, most unbelievably, Seabrook plans to do a design review of check valves at the Seabrook station. Now what this means to me is they need to go back and verify that the check valves being used in the Seabrook station in safety systems are in fact suitable for the purpose for which they're being used. According to the INPO documents, this check valve design review program will be completed perhaps sometime between October of 1990 and April of 1991, depending on which particular INPO document one chooses to believe. In summary, Mr. Chairman, I do not believe the NRC had a basis for issuing the license. I do not believe that Mr. Carr can possibly be correct that the NRC staff has approved the license knowing of these deficiencies. I would like to stop there and let Mr. Nader conclude because in my view, one of the major issues at Seabrook is the adequacy of emergency planning. Having lived a great deal of my life on Long Island, I'm not familiar with the emergency plan problems at Seabrook, but it's quite clear to me the remaining witnesses are the experts on emergency planning in the Seabrook area, not the NRC. What this means, Mr. Chairman, is that the Atomic Power Industry's own monitoring agency, INPO, has concluded right up to date that there are serious unresolved safety deficiencies at the Seabrook Power Station, which have not been corrected. And yet, the NRC, the, the Reagan-Bush government, 
has given it a full power operating license. I want to emphasize these findings, which were secret until today, say in common words that Seabrook is not up to the standards of the atomic power industry's own monitoring institute and that they are not up to the standards in significant ways, and the word significant was used by the nuclear power industry's own monitoring institute. And yet, the Bush administration, yes, let's use the words, President George Bush's government is giving a full operating license. Now, anything these findings argue Anything short of correcting the grave safety deficiencies would constitute grounds, in my opinion, of criminal negligence in the operation, supervision, and regulation of the Seabrook nuclear plant. Any harm proceeding from any uncorrected safety problems, such as a nuclear leak or a meltdown, should justify a criminal indictment for willing and knowing violations. A full congressional investigation is needed with all pertinent officials and analysts from the Public Service Company of New Hampshire, the Institute of Nuclear Power Operations, and the U.S. Nuclear, Nuclear Regulatory Commission, ordered to respond to congressional questioning. No further movement toward power operations should be permitted by the NRC, which should immediately modify, suspend, or revoke the operating license for the Seabrook plant pending completion of such an investigation. As a backup, legislation should be introduced into Congress toward that end. So if it is not done by regulatory action, it will have an opportunity to be done by congressional action. The life of the land and its people is at stake here. For at least a 100-mile radius around Seabrook and the Boston Bay Area, there's a dangerous instrumentality about to go into effect. Producing electricity that is not needed, that is too costly, and that is unnecessary and too dangerous. Those, of the, those among the citizens in the greater Boston Bay Area who have viewed year after year the valiant efforts of their co-neighbors who have protested against Seabrook, who have filed in pickets, who have done the hard work and the research, who have informed the media, should ask themselves, do they ever want to wake up the morning after? Should heaven forbid there be a nuclear disaster at Seabrook and say to themselves, we wished we were active too? We're dealing here with a crisis in government unaccountability, with the repudiation of the essential currency of democracy, which is the right of the people to know about what the government knows and what it's doing to, associate, to assure their safety or the lack thereof. It is often a characteristic of the human mind, Mr. Chairman, that what is obvious to a 10-year-old what is obvious to a farmer, what is obvious to a teacher, is not obvious to government bureaucrats and their so-called experts. And yet these experts and bureaucrats have been repeatedly sur surprised by things that have gone wrong in technology. I hope that you and your colleagues can communicate an urgency that I have not seen reflected by some members of this commission. And if not an urgency, that you can succeed in communicating at least a decent sense of curiosity so that pro-nuclear legislators such as Congressman Smith of the state of Oregon will at least write a letter tomorrow to the Nuclear Regulatory Commission asking for INPO evaluation reports regarding the Trojan nuclear plant, a much troubled plant in the state of Oregon. What is most troubling to those of us who believe that the energy problems of our nation can be solved if once we accept 
that conservation is preferable even though it reduces the sales of Exxon and Peabody Coal and Boston Edison. And once we accept that the same genius that brought us harmful technology can more benignly bring us solar energy in all its manifestations, including applying 2,000-year-old passive solar energy standards to buildings, to those of us who believe that this country will not be blackmailed into accepting atomic power plants which cannot be fully insured, which are vulnerable to earthquakes, which are very vulnerable to disastrous sabotage, which are very jeopardizing of the genetic inheritance of the people of this country, and which cannot be justified on an economic basis, that we will not be blackballed or blackmailed into accepting this malicious form of energy simply by being told that jobs will be lost or we won't be globally competitive or we won't be able to stem the greenhouse effect. Massive displays of readily knowable energy efficiency and application, lights, motor vehicles, buildings, can be applied, as Amory Lovins has stated, on so many public occasions including meetings with utility executives, to reduce both the greenhouse effect and the need for nuclear power. And so can the transition to, to solar energy, which was urged upon us in 1952 by President Truman's Materials Policy Commission in its celebrated report to this country. I find a numbing of both senses of curiosity and of the lessons of TMI, Browns Ferry, and Chernobyl on Capitol Hill. I commend your inexhaustible determination to keep this issue alive so that others may live. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you uh, very, very much. Uh, the Chair will recognize itself uh, at this point for around the questions, and I, I'd begin it with an observation, and uh, off time it's lost um, in the rhetorical uh, asides that, uh, uh, sub, that uh, congressional subcommittee hearings can uh, engage in. But uh, following up on the point which Mr. Nader made, uh, right now, out in the Sierra Desert in California, the Israelis, uh, in their Luz project, have 200, who have a 200 megawatt solar uh, mirrored project in operation. And they're planning on adding another 200 megawatts over the next uh, couple of years. Now this is not part of a huge government subsidized uh, nuclear power industry or uh, uh, coal depletion allowance or oil industry. This to a large extent is a result of the imagination, the ingenuity, and the creativity, the drive of a small number of people that really do believe that our future is headed there. And it's now, and it's in operation. Nuclear is not the answer. Solar is not only the answer of the 21st century, but it could be the answer before the end of the 20th century if we directed our resources in a way that could have 20,000 megawatt solar-powered uh, generating facilities out in the middle of the desert in California, wheeling and interconnecting that, that electricity uh, into the surrounding state, showing how you could do it uh, in other parts of the country. But unfortunately, thus far, utilities in our country are still too much committed to uh, a, fo a fossil or, or, or nuclear-powered uh, electrical generating capacity. But it is efficiency, it is solar, it is alternatives, which are our future. It's inevitable. The only question is how much time will it take us to finally uh, force this recognition, recognition on those who make the decisions at utilities. My question to you, Mr. Pollard or Mr. Nader, is this. In your opinion, do you believe that the information which you have unearthed uh, in the IMPO documents, uh, would it have been sufficient, in your opinion, to have denied the 
issuance of a license at the Seabrook nuclear power plant at this time. There's no doubt in my mind, Mr. Chairman, that the information contained in the info documents, had it been made available to the parties in the Seabrook proceeding, the plant would not today be licensed. What cause? Because it demonstrates nonconformance with the NRC's safety requirements. Which of the safety requirements which you listed do you believe would have caused the greatest infirmity to the application process? Now that's a more difficult question to answer for two reasons, at least two. First, the info documents themselves are quite specific that they only listed what they considered to be the most significant deficiencies, <coughs> implying that there were more. Second of all, I had only had time to give you a sampling of the issues which are in these documents. My choice of those were I tried to choose those which were more easily understandable by the layperson, as well as those which would directly relate to issues in the Seabrook proceeding and to NRC regulations. I'm sorry. Certainly my view of one of the most outrageous examples that I have reviewed in detail deals with the check valves at Seabrook because They've already had failures of check valves. INPO warned them about the significance of inadequate maintenance programs. By sending them these SOER earlier, they re-emphasized it to Seabrook. And still, there's not a preventive maintenance program, or they haven't even <clears throat> finished their design review. And how they could possibly think that this plan can be safe to operate when they themselves, you see, that's the point. It's public service which believes they need to do something. What is the relevance to, in, in your mind, Mr. Pollard, of the fact that the chairman of the Nuclear Regulatory Commission does not want to have access to these documents? Well, I'm, I'd have to say, Mr. Chairman, I basically agreed with the testimony of the chairman on that subject because from my own experience in the NRC, they do not have the resources to review every single document and generate in every plan. Um, they must rely upon the honesty and integrity of the utilities who are applying for licenses for these plants. I have never yet understood INPO's desire for secrecy. It seems to me a great deal of the opposition to nuclear power has been engendered by cover-ups of misdeeds in the past. And therefore, if I were INPO, I would take the view that while it might be painful in the short term to disclose these reports, it seems to me it's the only way in the long term to earn the confidence of the public if nuclear power industry is to have a future You're role. not saying, Mr. Paula, though, that you believe that no Staff? No. You asked, the I Nuclear thought, Regulatory Commission should have been able to gain access to this information? Are you saying that you believe that the NRC is no, understaffed no. to the extent to which they don't have enough uh, personnel to? No, sir. Perhaps I'm having the same trouble Mr. Carr had and not listening carefully to what you asked. I thought you asked me what did I think about Mr. Carr not having seen the report. And I, that's, to my view, perfectly understandable. What is your view that the NRC staff then? Oh, well, the NRC staff clearly should have looked at the Seabrook reports okay. for two reasons. Yeah. One. All right, well, I, I understand. Well, now, what is your view then? Let me, I'm, I'm trying to reach a, 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 a thought here, which is that if the NRC staff did not review the INPO documents, in your opinion, is that unacceptable? on a plant of this controversy. Well, I'm again going to have to ask you what unacceptable in what respect? Um, unacceptable to the extent to which uh, there have been considerable questions raised around this question, around this uh, utility's ability to manage itself, 
around the adequate question of the adequacy of the emergency evacuation plan and the relevancy of the information which INPO uh, de develops uh, that is directly related to the issues in question. Okay. I consider it unacceptable for the staff if they did not look at these reports for the following reasons. First of all, the NRC has had recent experience by which they know that INPO reports contain information they're unaware of. The incident I speak of is at a plant in upstate New York, Nama Point Unit 1, that utility illegally and impermissibly under the license turned the room into a radioactive waste storage tank. For 10 years it existed, they did nothing about it, covered it up, the NRC resident inspector didn't even know about it, and they have doses in the 100 rim range up there as well. Given that experience, given the controversy over the Seabrook plant, much of it, in my view, valid controversy, given the certainty with which this plant licensing decision was going to go to court, it seems to me the NRC would have made every effort, including looking at the INPO reports, to make sure they hadn't missed any valid safety okay. issues. Thank you. Now, given that, and uh, assuming that uh, Commissioner Carr was accurate and that his staff did review them, and that uh, the problems which you have identified in your testimony came to the attention of the NRC staff, is it your opinion that that information should have then been communicated to the Chairman of the Nuclear Regulatory Commission? because of its direct relevance on the question which they were considering. If the NRC staff reviewed these INPO documents which I have reviewed, and if, as Mr. Carr testified, the NRC staff approved issuance of the license knowing this information, then clearly that should have been brought to the attention of first the licensing boards and the parties and of course thereby the attention of the commission. Okay. So in your opinion then, the uh, NRC staff would have acted improperly if uh, this information had been in their possession, they had done the evaluation, and not had communicated it to uh, the levels of authority above them uh, at the NRC. I must answer this question very specifically. Since the INPO reports themselves contain information about issues which either were in the Seabrook hearings or which the parties tried to introduce into the Seabrook proceeding, the NRC staff would have directly violated the p practices and procedures of the NRC for as far as what they should do with this information when they discover it. They must, are required to, okay. disclose it to the parties and the board. Now, let me follow up uh, along the other track, which is that you mentioned that this information should have been forwarded to uh, all of the intervening parties as well. Uh, upon what basis do you make that statement? Well, particularly on contested issues, the whole purpose of the hearing is that all parties have access to the information which is being presented to the licensing board. You're not permitted, rightly so, to keep some information secret from some parties and not others. Okay. Mr. Nader? Any comment? Let me just note how serious these INPO findings are. On page 16 of our testimony, Mr. Chairman, INPO finding, quote, insufficient management attention has been given to the development and implementation of a radioactive waste handling program. As a result, although generation of radioactive waste has begun and the plant expects to begin power ascension in the near future, Key segments of the radioactive waste program are not in place. Examples, responsibilities for the processing of radioactive waste are unclear. Example, 
reorganization and staffing to create the proposed utilities radioactive waste organization is incomplete. Example, the radioactive waste minimization committee at Seabrook has not met in over two years and has not addressed existing station practices that, that contribute to unnecessary generation of radioactive waste. Repeat, addressed existing station practices at Seabrook that contribute to unnecessary generation of radioactive waste. Management oversight has not been effective in identifying and correcting these problems. They revolted for lesser reasons at Lexington and Concord, Mr. Chairman. In my district, I might add, probably why they're revolting and the other and the uh, uh, immediate uh, adjoining area to my uh, district. There is a certain personality type that uh, we seem to attract in eastern Massachusetts. Um, the, um, um, but to just to make the point, here you have these, these members of the commission and they just shrugged you off as if, you know, we're too busy. We don't need to. We have access to it. And if we need it, we'll read it. And then when you ask them specific questions, they start talking sub -judice. I must assume that you were amused by Chairman Carr's unprecedented sensitivity to matters of due process. <laughs> it, it was not lost upon me that, uh, that uh, he at least has been able to learn the language uh, of the law. Uh, although he, he, the, the meaning of it, unfortunately, has been lost upon the Nuclear Regulatory Commission, at least during my 14 years' experience with it. And uh, as we know, it was created 15 years ago out of the Atomic Energy Commission because they had lost any sense of the meaning of, uh, of uh, close oversight of the nuclear industry. So we're uh, at a crossroads. I, uh, uh, I think that the information which you have brought to the uh, subcommittee today is uh, directly relevant uh, to the question of whether or not the Seabrook plan should be given a full power license for operation. And uh, I can promise you that I intend to pursue this as vigorously uh, as possible uh, to ensure uh, that at least the case has been made. Uh, but God knows that over all these years, the case has been made over and over and over again. And uh, only a deaf ear has been turned to the, case, the uh, pleas of the people who live in that area. Uh, and to all the legitimate concerns that have been raised by Jim Shannon at the, uh, the, the State uh, Office of Attorney General of Massachusetts, his predecessor, Frank Bellotti, uh, Attorney General uh, uh, Rudman of New Hampshire in the 1970s, uh, touching upon these very same questions of inadequacy of emergency evacuation planning. May I just suggest in concluding, Mr. Chairman, that, that all citizens who are interested in protecting where they live and where they work from the risk of nuclear power accidents and the risk of transportation of nuclear waste and the deposit of nuclear waste, ask their senator and representative by letter or by telegram in writing to request that the Nuclear Regulatory Commission release the INPO reports, the evaluation reports relevant to nuclear power plants in their district, whether it's Turkey Point or Oyster Creek, or Millstone, or Trojan, or San Onofre, or Comanche Peak, or any of the other 110 nuclear plants operating in this country. Let's get it all out on the open. You paid for it, consumers. You paid for these reports. And the people who work for you as taxpayers in Washington better disclose them. As you know, Mr. Nader, I 100% agree with you. This should be out on the public domain. Uh, it ought to be evaluated in a public forum. Uh, the people have a right to see uh, this, uh, the, the questions which have been raised about uh, safety problems at nuclear power plants that uh, millions of people in this country uh, have to live in, not by their own choice, but by the choice of, this, of utilities in planting these nuclear power plants in densely populated areas of the country. I do hope, however, that this uh, hearing, as, it, as we end the, the, uh, the, the uh, the day 
uh, once again makes it abundantly clear that the nuclear power industry, if it ever does try to plant a, uh, a, a site a nuclear power plant in this country, will never again try to put, build one on a beach. Uh, will never again try to build one on an earthquake fault. Will never again try to build one in any of these densely populated areas that are absolutely impossible to evacuate. Uh, but my hope, my dream, my wish is that our country understand that we got a safe, we have a safer. Uh, and a saner route uh, that we can travel that ensures that we have plentiful energy, electricity into the indefinite future, and that is the uh, alternative energy path, the solar path, the efficiency path that uh, Mr. Nader referred to. We thank you both for your testimony here today. We have one final uh, panel that uh, we would like to reach before the end of the day, but it's with the thanks of the committee that... Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Let, let me make the announcement that we invited Mr. Edward Brown, who is the President and Chief Executive Officer of New Hampshire Yankee, to testify uh, before this hearing today. Uh, he uh, has refused uh, the invitation of the uh, subcommittee to appear before us today. And um, we uh, are um, very much regretful of that. but. Uh, uh, we understand uh, their reluctance to testify. Uh, let us um, then try, if we could, to consolidate uh, two of the panels into one, and perhaps then we will be able to uh, reach a speedier conclusion to today's hearing. Uh, and that final panel would consist of Mr. Steve Jonas, who is the Deputy Attorney General and uh, Chief of the Public Protection Bureau uh, from the state of Massachusetts, representing Attorney General Jim Shannon of the state of Massachusetts here today, Representative Larry Alexander, the House Chairman of the Joint Committee on Energy from the Massachusetts State Legislature, uh, Mr. Bob Backus, Esquire, who is uh, counsel to the Seacoast uh, Anti-Pollution League, and Ms. Diane Curran, Esquire, counsel to the New England Coalition on Nuclear Pollution. Uh, welcome to you all. We apologize for the um, um, long delay in reaching this uh, final panel, uh, but uh, it is an unusual situation that we're in, and we wanted to ensure that all points of view uh, have been heard, uh, including this one, which is uh, in many ways the most important, because uh, the experts on this case are now sitting before us. Uh, they have to live with the plant, and they also have to live with the ramifications of any decision that the court and the NRC make. So let's turn and uh, begin by, by uh, recognizing you, Mr. Jonas. If you could, please begin your testimony. Uh, thank you, uh, and good evening, uh, Representative Markey. I want to thank uh, you and uh, the chairman and uh, the other members of the uh, subcommittee for the opportunity to come here and testify. Uh, as many of you know, Jim Shannon, uh, the Attorney General from Massachusetts, is the uh, third Attorney General uh, to be in the Seabrook proceedings. It started in 1974 with Attorney General Quinn, uh, went on for some time with Attorney General Bellotti, and Attorney General Shannon uh, came into this fight uh, in 1987. Uh, I would uh, ask uh, that uh, the committee uh, include uh, my written uh, remarks in the record. Uh, the, uh, the written remarks of all the witnesses on this panel will be included in the record in their entirety without objection. Thank you. Uh, given the intervening uh, events of, uh, of uh, court action uh, this evening, I thought it might be appropriate to, to begin by attempting to clarify uh, where we are at the present uh, uh, posture. The court did deny a stay uh, of the issuance of the license which, if that were the last court action, would permit operation of Seabrook uh, at this point. Uh, it is important to remember, though, that the court appeal remains. Uh, the case has not been dismissed by any means. Uh, and uh, the people uh, in, in front of you on this panel will continue uh, that, that court fight. Uh, we are going to be considering what options uh, we have uh, uh, in the next uh, few uh, hours, if not a day or two, uh, to uh, prevent the operation of the plant. But at, at this point, it's important to rep, uh, remember that the court case continues and will continue 
uh, in uh, trying to uh, overturn what the NRC did with Seabrook. Let me uh, summarize the two issues I'd like to uh, speak about now. One involves substance and one involves process. Both come out of the Seabrook proceedings and both illustrate uh, for this committee, perhaps now after uh, the court declined to get involved uh, initially, uh, better than ever, uh, the importance of the Congress in taking a look at the process that led to uh, Seabrook's licensing. Uh, there has been some discussion of the first issue which has to do with uh, what is the standard by which the NRC is going to judge emergency planning at Seabrook or any other plant. Uh, back in the New Hampshire emergency plan proceedings, uh, our office, along with other interveners, attempted to have the licensing board consider testimony uh, from uh, a panel of experts uh, which demonstrated what the dose consequences, what the radiation dose consequences of a range of accidents uh, would be at the Seabrook site, given a number of considerations like the meteorological conditions and like the evacuation times in the area. Uh, Chairman Carr uh, referred to these uh, accident scenarios as hypothetical. In fact, they are the scenarios that his agency uh, has postulated and has required emergency planning for. The testimony presented a very bleak picture of what would happen at Seabrook if there were an accident and if that accident, accident were one of the range of fast-breaking accidents that the NRC has required uh, utilities to look at and, uh, and, and apply and, and uh, plan for. The licensing board declined to admit that testimony, calling it irre irrelevant. The appeal board got into the act and said, we don't know whether it's relevant or not because we don't know what standard will apply here. Ten years after the, after the emergency planning rules went into effect, uh, the appeal board of the NRC was unable to say what it is that, if, that adequate emergency planning really means. That in itself uh, should be something this com committee is concerned about, and I know that there have been letters from the committee going to the NRC to try to explain, to ask the NRC to explain that uh, turn of events. On March 1, when the commission decided that uh, it would license uh, Seabrook, uh, it came out with a decision which said, in effect, we are not in the business of determining whether their emergency plans actually work. We will not examine whether any particular emergency planning comes up with any particular range of dose savings. We are not concerned whether any particular emergency plan involves too long of evacuation times, and we are not concerned whether the sheltering plan for any particular emergency plan will actually protect uh, the public. The question uh, is not whether uh, we wish to impose our judgment on the NRC or even whether the Congress wishes to impose uh, a particular judgment for a particular plan. The question is whether this agency, which is assertedly the expert agency, is going to make any judgment at all. And as of March 1, it's come to the conclusion that it will not make that judgment. Turning uh, to the second issue, which is an issue of process, uh, which I'm, I know that the committee has been quite concerned about as well, uh, back on uh, November 7th, of 1989, the appeal board in reviewing the New Hampshire emergency plans came to the conclusions that, were f that there were four serious flaws in those plans, including the lack of a sheltering plan uh, for the New Hampshire beach population. It reversed the licensing board, it remanded the case back to the licensing board, and two days later the licensing board in essence thumbed its nose at the appeal board and went ahead and authorized the license anyway. The Commission stepped into the breach and out of what it called uh, a concern for efficiency decided to take over this dispute between the Appeal Board and the Licensing Board. The conclusion it came to uh, is contained in one of its two rulings on March 1. That conclusion is, in essence, that whatever flaws exist in the emergency plans and despite the fact that the appeal board has concluded that it could not approve the New Hampshire plans, that the license could issue and that the flaws could be fixed afterwards. 
Apparently, if the hearings that this Congress has mandated lead to the wrong result, then the NRC is unprepared to withhold a license, certainly not deny it, not even, not even prepared to withhold a license, but will just say, start operation, fix the, fix the flaws later. The process concern here and for the Congress ought to be that the Atomic Energy Act requires public hearings, and they're there for a purpose. And if the NRC is going to take an approach that says, heads we win, tails you lose, if you prevail in, in public hearings and, and the conclusion, at the conclusion the plans are not approvable, we're going to go ahead and license, then that, in our view, is inconsistent and directly violates what it is the Congress had in mind in, with the public hearing requirement in the Atomic Energy Act. The, the case uh, on Seabrook is uh, far from over. Uh, there have been a number of issues uh, that have come up through the proceedings. There are, are a number of issues in the court, courts right now. One of the things that, that uh, uh, we as uh, public officials and as interveners in the process face when we get into court is the notion uh, which is often stated in court opinions on challenges to NRC decisions that the NRC is virtually unprecedented in the amount of deference uh, given to it by Congress in doing its business. We're, we're here today, I think, uh, to urge the Congress to rein in on that deference, uh, to require judgments to be made, hard judgments by the NRC when it's evaluating emergency plans, to honor its rules and to honor the public hearing process. Uh, we commend you for uh, these hearings, uh, and uh, I thank you for the opportunity to testify, and if there are any questions, I'd be happy to answer them. Thank you, Mr. Jonas, very much. Uh, Representative Alexander, you and uh, Attorney General Shannon have been fighting valiantly on this uh, issue up in the state of Massachusetts. Uh, we look forward to your testimony. Thank you very much, Congressman. Uh, for the record, I'm State Rep Larry Alexander. I'm the House Chairman of the Massachusetts Legislature's Joint Committee on Energy, which has jurisdiction over nuclear power issues. And my own legislative district, where I'm from, is located about 30 miles south of the Seabrook nuclear power plant. So it's obviously an issue of concern to my constituents as well. I want you to know how much I appreciate your holding this hearing, and I'm honored to have been invited to participate. And it's nice to be on this side of the table uh, and to have that experience uh, instead of uh, uh, overseeing a hearing. America is a diverse country, and its people hold a broad spectrum of political opinions. Uh, some Americans favor nuclear power, and some Americans don't. This diversity of opinion is about as American as apple pie. But there's another important American tradition as well, and that's the principle of fair play. Americans believe in fair play. We have a due process clause in our Constitution and our Bill of Rights that's based on this principle. Today's hearing, contrary to some of the questioning that took place earlier, is not about nuclear power. But it is about fair play. A large number of Americans are outraged because an important agency of our federal government, the Nuclear Regulatory Commission, has not displayed this fundamental characteristic of fair play, and that's why we're here today. Some agencies are meant to be advocates, and some are meant to be regulators. There used to be so much confusion about which role the old Atomic Energy Commission was meant to be that to end the confusion, presumably, the AEC was split into two different agencies. One, the Department of Energy, which was meant to be an advocate for various energy issues, and two, the Nuclear Regulatory Commission, which was meant to be a regulator. Somewhere along the line, the NRC got its signals crossed. Maybe somewhere along the line, it started getting very strong signals from a certain location on Pennsylvania Avenue. And that's why all of this has happened. But for the past several years, the NRC has been a stronger advocate of nuclear power, I might add, than even the DOE, if that can be imagined. Its bias has become so strong that a lot of people have suggested it really should be called the Nuclear Advocacy Commission, the NAC, instead of the NRC. Never has this organization exhibited this bias more than in its proceedings concerning Seabrook. Because every time there was a regulatory obstacle that stood in the way of licensing Seabrook, the NRC simply removed the obstacle by changing the rules of the game. Its behavior was sort of like that of a referee 
who changes the rules in the middle of a game whenever the referee's favorite team was losing. The evidence supporting this assertion would fill a lot of pages, but I'd like to just summarize some of the particularly disturbing examples. First of all, back in 1984, Seabrook couldn't meet the requirement that a utility must make a preliminary showing of the adequacy of emergency response plans before even receiving a low-power license. But the fact that Seabrook couldn't meet this requirement didn't matter to the NRC. The NRC simply changed its rule to accommodate Seabrook, said you don't need to. A second rule required that sirens had to be tested as operational before low-power testing could be authorized. Because sirens were dismantled by local officials in Massachusetts, Seabrook could not conduct low-power testing and adhere to this rule. So the NRC, again, came to Seabrook's rescue by just eliminating this rule about sirens. Governor Michael Dukakis, in a third instance, and Massachusetts civil defense officials concluded after a lot of study that no plan could be developed to evacuate the beaches near Seabrook in any reasonable amount of time, and therefore they refused to submit a state emergency response plan to the Federal Emergency Management Agency, FEMA, and the NRC. Even though a requirement existed that states must give their approval to emergency plans before the federal government could issue a license to nuclear power plants, the NRC again has chosen to ignore its own rule. And since Seabrook couldn't have been licensed, if it had focused on that rule, the NRC simply eliminated the rule. Again, in 1986, FEMA concluded that the Seabrook emergency plans were not adequate to protect the public. The NRC, instead of listening to what FEMA's conclusions were, instead pressured FEMA to reverse this decision. When veteran FEMA official Ed Thomas refused to change his decision, he was demoted, and he was replaced by an inexperienced political operative, frankly, named Grant Peterson, who did reverse the decision. So, faced with an uncooperative bureaucrat, the NRC simply made sure that the bureaucrat was changed. A fifth example, NRC regulations state that emergency plans must be, quote, adequate to protect the public, quote, and be plans that, quote, can and will be implemented, quote, which means that NRC panels would have to determine that they are actually workable. But as has mentioned before, been before earlier, in licensing Seabrook on March 1st of this year, the NRC just ignored this requirement. To the NRC, testimony on whether the plans would actually work was irrelevant. The NRC's decision flies in the face of Congress's original intent. Congress agreed with the NRC's special inquiry group on Three Mile Island, you might remember, that said that workable emergency response plans should be a requirement for each nuclear power plant. The NRC panel also recommended, with limited exceptions, the, quote, closing down of existing plants that cannot meet these new criteria, end of quote. So following Three Mile Island and this special report, the NRC issued new regulations requiring workable emergency response plans no matter how safe a plant was considered to be. The NRC explained that, and these are their words, quote, the protection provided by siting and engineered design features must be bolstered by the ability to take protective measures during the course of an accident, end of quote. The Hendry Commission agreed that, quote, emergency preparedness is an essential aspect, essential in the protection of the public health and safety, end of quote. So the commission issued this new requirement while recognizing that, and I quote, the operation of some reactors may be affected by an inability to comply with these rules, end of quote. Yet less than a decade later, faced with the fact that the Seabrook reactor would not be licensed under its earlier interpretation of the rule, the NRC just changed its interpretation of the rule. The primary lesson we gained from Three Mile Island was that accidents can and will happen. The NRC itself has acknowledged that there is a 45% likelihood of a serious core meltdown at some nuclear power plant in the United States in the next 20 years, which could potentially release more radiation than Chernobyl. No United States containment structure, not even Seabrooks, was designed to withstand all core meltdowns. Each American reactor was designed before Three Mile Island, before a core meltdown was considered to be a, quote, credible, quote, event. Yet the NRC seems to believe that American reactors are so safe there is no need to worry about another Three Mile Island or an American Chernobyl-sized release. I'm afraid, however, that this false sense of security is precisely the mindset identified by the President's Commission on Three Mile Island as being so very dangerous. That commission wrote, quote, the belief that nuclear power plants are sufficiently safe grew into a conviction, end of quote, at the NRC and urged that the NRC make sure to change this mindset. In its single most important overall conclusion, the Three Mile Island Commission warned, quote, 
to prevent nuclear accidents as serious as Three Mile Island, fundamental changes will be necessary in the organization, procedures, and practices, and above all, in the attitudes of the NRC. And to the extent that the institutions we investigated are typical of the nuclear industry. End of quote. Well, unfortunately, many of these fundamental changes were never implemented. And I believe that this same mindset that the NRC was so criticized about after Three Mile Island continues to prevail in the NRC and has, in fact, intensified as exemplified by the NRC's constantly changing its own rules in order to do everything it could to license Seabrook. This mindset can be seen in the NRC's failure to resolve the more than 100 unresolved generic safety issues that currently exist concerning nuclear power plants. These are serious safety problems that the NRC recognizes as serious as applying to all or most nuclear power plants. Yet as the GAO noted in 1988, the NRC was taking up to 10 years to identify solutions, not to mention the sometimes unlimited timetables that they granted the industry to implement corrective measures. New unresolved generic safety issues, in fact, have actually cropped up faster than the old ones have been resolved by the NRC. I want to conclude by returning to the recommendation of the NRC's own investigators into Three Mile Island, who criticized the slow pace of the NRC in addressing serious safety issues. They said, over the years, the nuclear industry and its regulators have identified what have been considered to be serious safety problems and recommendations, whose significance has been underscored by ringing statements to the effect that unless such problems are resolved promptly, a license should be revoked or the industry shut down. Many of these problems are still outstanding. While we do not undertake to set out deadlines, we do believe that the Congressional Oversight Committees should hold the NRC accountable with respect to such issues. Well, that's just what your panel hopefully is trying to do, and I commend this panel for exercising that oversight jurisdiction of this renegade agency. I urge you to ensure that fair play is restored to NRC proceedings and that a proper concern for the health and safety of the citizens of this country, as opposed to the promotion of the nuclear power industry, becomes the dominant focus of the Nuclear Regulatory Commission. Thank you very much. Thank you, Representative Alexander, very, very much. Um, our uh, next witness, Mr. Robert Backus, is the counsel to the Seacoast Anti-Pollution League. Uh, welcome once again, Mr. Backus. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, first of all, Mr. Chairman, there's a lot of sort of rhetorical pleasantries at these meetings, but I'd can like you, to... Can you move the microphone yes. a little bit closer? I say there's a lot of rhetorical pleasantries at these meetings, but I'd like to say, Mr. Chairman, personally, uh, we have a very great debt of gratitude to you for your role in this committee and your years in Congress in trying to speak the truth about the problems. It's something that's not been too common in many congressional offices. I don't think it's too common in my own representative's office, but you have uh, stood uh, for the truth about this issue consistently, and we're very, very grateful. I'd like to say, uh, uh, Congressman, that uh, I'm quite amazed that I see that in this entire hearing uh, list of witnesses, I'm the only witness from the state of New Hampshire. Maybe this plant got moved somewhere else when I wasn't looking, but I don't think so. I know that's not your committee's fault. I know you asked our governor to be here. I think it speaks volumes about the quality of the political leadership in our state government that, there, that nobody from our state government has appeared at this hearing, although it was the New Hampshire Radiological Emergency Response Plan for Seabrook, which the NRC's own appeal board, the NRC's own appeal board held was deficient in four areas. Nothing has been heard from the state, nothing from our attorney general, nothing from our governor, who I think does have a voice and is capable of speaking. Having said that, I would like to acknowledge one elected official in New Hampshire that I know did not get early enough notice to be here, and that's our senior senator, Senator Gordon Humphrey, who was voluntarily leaving his position. I know his statement has been entered into your record. I'd like to say, as all his statements on this matter have, his statement is eloquent to the point, and as you yourself have done, I think, speaks to the truth of the issue here instead of the posturing we've seen. His statement is eloquent testimony also, Mr. Chairman, that the issue of public health and safety at Seabrook is not a partisan issue, is not a political issue, and not an issue that's solely a matter of concern to only one uh, officials on one side of our, of our common border. Uh, Mr. Chairman, my uh, testimony is available to you, and I know you've agreed to enter into the record with the attachments. I'd just like to add a few comments uh, on this day. Uh, um, I'm sometimes uh, thought if I was going to start this project again and I was asked uh, 
what law books would be necessary to deal with the NRC's licensing. I'd say no law books are necessary. All you need is Alice in Wonderland and Kafka's The Trial. The NRC has set up a Byzantine Kafka-esque procedure. Even today, I heard Chairman Carr say their decisions weren't final. They'll be not final until they're moot. That's their proceeding. Finding the right eye of the needle in which to fit a petition for judicial review becomes an exercise in, uh, in uh, medieval scholasticism. Uh, the agency has manipulated the process intended by the Congress to be due process into a sham, into a fraud. We've heard a lot about how they've tortured the act of Congress, the Authorization Acts. Well, they've gone beyond that. They're torturing the English language beyond its common meaning. In their decision on March 1st, they said, no, our appeal board was wrong. Emergency planning isn't a second tier safety measure, which was a ridiculous idea because as Representative Alexander points out, it was described as essential. It's a first tier safety measure. Then they describe it as a backstop. Mr. Chairman, when I used to play baseball, the backstop was behind the catcher so that the foul balls, if the catcher didn't catch them, didn't go hit somebody in the, uh, in the stands. That's what I thought a backstop was. Then they said it was a second or third line of defense, but it's first tier. An agency that will trifle with the integrity of our language like this is unworthy of uh, our respect. But FEMA is, is, is not unwilling to uh, be exceeded in this idiocy. FEMA has filed testimony on the problem of sheltering at the beaches, a matter of very great concern, a matter well illustrated by uh, this picture I know uh, you've seen before that's down there, the types of shelters are clam shacks and ice cream stands. The idea that these are going to provide, provide shelter. So what did FEMA say? FEMA said, well, now we've looked carefully at the New Hampshire plan, and New Hampshire's plan is sheltering in place. If you're at home, stay at home. If you're at work, Stay at work. If you're at the beach, evacuate in your vehicle. Sheltering is evacuation. First tier is a backstop. Adequacy is complying with a checklist. There is no truth in this. There is no ability to communicate with those people. I can only say, I hope, uh, Mr. Chairman, that out of this will come at long last some congressional action. The only effective congressional action I can think of is to defund the NRC. But you say, now that's a, that's a very radical idea. After all, they regulate some 110 licensed nuclear plants, of which I guess some 96 are currently operating. But we found out that the regulation of this industry is truly illusory. It does not exist. The regulations are changed at will. They are inherently, they are flexible to the extent that they lose all meaning. I think this agency will pay no attention until this agency's budget is attended to, and that's what I would recommend. Thank you very much. Well said. Thank you, Mr. Backus. And our final witness, Ms. Diane Curran, is counsel to uh, the New England Coalition on Nuclear Pollution. Welcome. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. I very much appreciate the opportunity to be here on behalf of NECMP today. We've been involved in the Seabrook licensing case since the early 1970s. I was very interested to hear comments here in the hearing room today that it's because of the interveners that this case has been delayed for so long. And I'd like to point out that if the NRC had listened to the interveners in the early 1970s when they said the Seabrook beaches cannot be evacuated safely during an emergency, that this, we wouldn't be sitting here today. The case would be over. But we're still waiting. We were waiting in 1970 Eight, when the Commission said, we're going to do a rulemaking for you, come back then. We were waiting in 1982 when the Commission said, we're going to have an operating license proceeding, come back then. And we're waiting now for a hearing on whether emergency planning at Seabrook can effectively protect the public around the plant. And we haven't got an answer yet. This case isn't just about the Seabrook nuclear plant, it's about it is truly about national energy policy, and it is truly about what Congress is willing to allow the NRC to get away with in not regulating nuclear power. You heard it here today. You heard Commissioner Carr say that the adequate protection standard has no content. It means nothing but a checklist 
with no regard to the sufficiency of measures that will be taken for the purpose of protecting the public. Are you willing to stand by and let this agency completely rob the standard that you instructed them to promulgate from any content whatsoever? This is it. They have abandoned the emergency planning standard. They don't need to revoke the rule. They've got the Seabrook decision to let them continue to do this on into eternity. You can, con you can forget about emergency planning as far as any CMP <coughs> is concerned. The standard has been gutted with the Seabrook decision. As for technical standards, you heard Commissioner Carr say some are more important than others. It's not too surprising to him that the NRC staff would, would sanction the licensing of the Seabrook nuclear power plant with major safety deficiencies in place that will not be corrected until a year and a half after licensing. What other safety standards does the Commission consider unimportant for purposes of allowing nuclear reactors to operate? You ought to find out, because there's a lot. For instance, there's one in the Seabrook low power license right now. Remarkably enough, it's a three mile island requirement for a safety parameters display system something that the NRC decided was absolutely necessary if plants were going to avoid the kind of near disaster that occurred at Three Mile Island. Seabrook doesn't have to have one until after the first refueling outage at the plant. The commissioners have told you that some standards are simply not important for the purposes of allowing a plant to operate. I ask Congress to investigate what standards these are and what is the NRC willing to let utilities get away with? As you've heard here, the Seabrook licensing case has been, in every respect, a travesty. <clears throat> the technical issues that you heard Ralph Nader and Bob Pollard discuss today were among the types of issues that interveners repeatedly tried to raise, which interveners had the right to raise before the commission during licensing hearings. The Commission erected a series of procedural hurdles and bounced us out. We're still trying to get a hearing on whether operators are adequately trained to respond to an emergency at Seabrook, on whether the maintenance, pro maintenance program, which is concededly seriously far behind, is adequate for purposes of allowing this plant to operate. And all these issues have been confirmed now by INPO but we haven't been able to get a hearing here. I'd like to say that uh, if you correct the problems at Seabrook, or that you, you uh, are able to help us with the procedural errors that have happened here and get us a new hearing, that all will be well. Unfortunately, Seabrook is the last licensing case under which uh, the old procedural rules will apply. They look wonderful in comparison to what's coming next. In all future licensing cases, interveners will have to come to the commission and make their case at the very outset, will have to essentially present their evidence before they've even had a chance to conduct discovery against the applicants. And as we heard today, there's a great deal of information that does not get into the NRC's licensing files uh, before before a great deal of investigation has been done. The NRC has also instituted a one-step licensing rule which will allow them to chop the licensing process into many pieces lasting over a long period of years. It's likely that uh, the NRC will approve uh, generic designs in rulemakings that the public out in America are not going to know about and when they learn in the local newspaper that some plant is about to be built in their backyard, they're also going to learn that all the safety issues that are going to affect them are considered to have been resolved years ago in a rulemaking that they knew nothing about. The NRC has come to you repeatedly to ask permission to do this. They thought they needed congressional permission in the past, and they didn't get it. Well, now they've just gone and taken it and done this on their own. We ask you, please, for the sake of our nation, for the sake of our environment, stop them. Thank you very much. Ms. Curran. Thank you, Ms. Curran, very, very much. Um, 
I'm going to, in, in the interest of a time, uh, uh, submit to the witnesses the written questions which uh, we have for you and ask if you could, in a very um, uh, timely fashion, uh, return the written responses to us for our um, use in our ongoing deliberations over the next uh, several weeks and months on this uh, uh, case. The um, Testimony today in many ways is uh, it's almost an all-star cast of the major players who have been involved in the decision uh, at uh, Seabrook over the last uh, uh, 19 years or since the Nuclear Regulatory Commission was created 15 years ago. Uh, the people who testified here today uh, represent in many ways the best and the worst of what uh, we have seen in the history of the Nuclear Regulatory Commission. Uh, I have no doubt that there's a good reason why there hasn't been a new nuclear power plant ordered in this country over the last 13 years and uh, it's largely a result of the people's efforts who are sitting at this table. The vigorous resistance of the short cutting of, of uh, due process and regulatory procedure. Uh, nonetheless, what we have on our hands is an anachronism, a throwback, an anomaly to an earlier era, to a time when governors uh, of New Hampshire and other states in conjunction with their utilities arbitrarily decided uh, that it would be possible to locate nuclear power plants in densely populated areas without any likelihood that, a nuclear, that uh, a, an emergency evacuation plan could be put in place. Um, what you have uh, helped to do for us today in this subcommittee is to frame these issues once again um, in a way uh, that will allow us to proceed um, in an orderly fashion uh, to ensure that the Nuclear Regulatory Commission is uh, uh, reminded of the ongoing uh, vigilance of the people who, um, who serve in Congress um, and who will have to live in the near vicinity of these plants. Uh, the people who are sitting at this table, uh, more than any others who have testified today or who are out there in the hinterland, have uh, largely uh, made it possible that the issues which we're debating here and have been debated um, uh, before the Circuit Court of Appeals uh, have been made national issues. Uh, and the fundamental change of attitude which has existed in our country is largely a result of the incredible commitment that uh, people like Mr. Backus and Ms. Curran and Representative Alexander and Mr. Jonas representing Jim Shannon and all of the predecessor attorney generals and deputy attorneys general who have worked on this issue. Um, there has been a fundamental change of opinion. Uh, there won't be any new nuclear power plants licensed in our country. There won't be any new orders even if they have streamlined um, the, uh, the procedures at the Nuclear Regulatory Commission unless and until they're fully factored in the incredible commitment that the people who are sitting at this table represent in communities all across the country. And they know that now. They've learned the lesson. And Seabrook is really the final chapter in the first stage of nuclear power in our country. And the question of whether or not there's ever going to be a second stage is largely going to, going to be determined by whether or not they learn the lessons that the people at this table tried to teach them. So regardless of how this case finally turns out, and my hope is that it does turn out on behalf of the interveners, the state of Massachusetts, and those that you represent, I think that uh, you have provided a mighty public service for this country because the lessons that they've learned are lessons that will be applied to any if, and if to any nuclear power generation that might succeed this last one, if any does in fact succeed it. So at this time I would like to uh, conclude the hearing with the thanks of the subcommittee. We'll submit these questions in writing to you, which we'd like to include in the record. I would also like to ask you to stay very close to the subcommittee uh, because uh, I think there's an intense amount of interest uh, that uh, is developing around these issues. And with that, this hearing is adjourned. Thank you. Let me just uh, let me make one final note, and that is that the subcommittee wishes to thank We the People for its help in uncovering various pieces of information for this hearing. We the People played a very important role in making uh, this hearing possible.
concludes Wednesday's hearing concerning the licensing of the Seabrook Nuclear Power Plant. Be sure to tune in later this morning at 11 a.m. Eastern Time, 8 a.m. on the West Coast for live gavel-to-gavel coverage of the U.S. House of Representatives. Coming up next on C-SPAN, it's a schedule update followed by a live call-in program concerning foreign aid.